Okay. Well, I want to welcome everyone to a very basic intro to Pyramid. So for most of the developers in the room, it may be a lot of uh, redundant information, but for uh, maybe like people who are doing the templates and want to know more about the back end, and then for a refresher on some of the tenants of the Pyramid application uh, framework, I think it'd be good to just kind of review those things. And then we're also going to post this up to the web so that people who may be starting out with Pyramid or interested in what Pyramid's about could uh, find this video and actually uh, dive into it a little deeper. So feel free to ask questions along the way. Uh, it should be pretty short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, the main part of the presentation is going to be about the, the main tenants of Pyramid itself. So as you guys know, uh, Pyramid is a Python-based web, web framework. Uh, it does have these basic tenants they've set out for themselves to uh, attempt to accomplish. So you can kind of see their simplicity, minimalism, uh, documentation. So that means having great documentation, uh, good coverage, speed, reliability. And the reliability would be 100% test coverage, for example. And then openness, having a, a very nice license. Uh, it's not GPL licensed. It has a repose license, which is very BSD-like associated with it. So there's very little limitations on the types of applications or types of other code you could use and release in conjunction with a, a Pyramid app itself. So there's some core concepts I want to cover, and they're, I've got them grouped by categories. Uh, Pyramid itself is like I said, loosely based on Zope. And the things you'll see from Zope, which was the thing that 6 is most familiar with, is going to be things like the extensibility, uh, the concept of traversal, and the declarative security. The other uh, areas that Pyramid draws from is the Pylons project. Pylons had this concept of routes, and that's now called URL dispatch inside of Pyramid. And then it also has, Pylons had a very non-opinionated view of the world, so you could use any type of templating or pers persistence layer that you'd like with it. And then uh, it also drew from Django. The, the views, the way you hook up your views to the uh, routed URLs uh, is very Django-like. And then the level of documentation of Django is something that the Pyramid team was uh, looking to it, uh, strive towards. So the core concepts we want to go over is, you know, in general, some of the things that uh, we mentioned earlier in the tenants was speed. Pyramid itself wants to be basically the fastest known web uh, framework out there. I, I think it still holds that title. I don't know if any other ones have come to s dismount it from that uh, position, but I think generally Pyramid is known to be very, very fast, especially when we're comparing it to the work we've been doing in Plone. I think you'll notice it's very, very flat, fast and pleasurable to work with. And it does support that small and large project scale. Uh, one of the things they thought through when building this uh, framework was the fact that you may want to start out small, and so maybe you're using a micro framework just to start, but why would you need to switch your framework later uh, if your project needs to scale out and actually handle more things? So, in a, Pyramid can handle single file web apps like a micro framework such as a bottle or a flask, but then it can also do very, very large, complex um, applications such as a, the Carl knowledge management tool. They did build in some things for you, so Pyramid does provide you with the sessions and some localization. It does support events and transaction management. But beyond that, it also supports giving you some basics I'll mention later when it comes to how URLs map to either objects or to views inside your system. But other than that, it doesn't make any opinions about, again, the, the persistence layer or the templating system you want to use or any other uh, Python libraries you'd like to bring into your project. So some of the areas here that make Pyramid different, and this is what I'm trying to go over with these uh, core concepts, is the things that make Pyramid a little more unique from some of the other systems that are out there, is uh, configuration does support a, different, a couple different ways to configure your Pyramid apps. So you can have this imperative configuration, uh, or even you can override the decorator-based configs using imperative configuration. So in that case, you're writing uh, code, Python code, to configure the app itself. Uh, the way you're probably going to see most of the configuration done in Pyramid, though, is going to be using the decorator-based configurations, which are really convenient and kind of more Grok-like, if you ever worked with the Grok um, framework at all. It does support uh, configuration conflict detection. So if you've got 
multiple packages trying to configure the same configurations, but it will go for the more local versus less local determinations and try and smartly override versus uh, completely bailing out on you, which is nice. It does think about being able to extend your app and have multiple apps served out of one instance of Pyramid, so you can do some multi-tenant like software as a service style hosting, kind of like the Carl Serve uh, multi-tenant Carl application. The configuration is, is more extensible to allow for that type of a setup. And then having flexible authentication authorizations uh, is loosely based on the, the pluggable authentication we've seen in Zopen Plone. One of the nice tools as a developer though is going to be the, the programmatic in, inspect, introspection of uh, configuration. So you could actually inspect the configuration as part of your view and build things like navigation or uh, portlet boxes, things like that, that would actually build upon areas that have been configured, uh, for example, as routes inside your app. When it comes to the URLs in Pyramid, we get the ability to generate URLs uh, from the framework itself. So I'll show an example of that in some of the templating and traversal and URL dispatch later. But it's very easy to actually call into the application and ask it to generate URLs so that as you build your app and you deploy in various locations, it won't break those URLs. And then you can also generate URLs to static resources that are either hosted inside of the Pyramid app or hosted in your static web server. Now, the, it also supports the two types of URL dispatch, which is based on the routes and then traversal, which is something we've been more familiar with in the Zope world is when you use traversal, you have a, a graph of objects and you just traverse down through those objects and then views get mapped to the objects based on the type of object they are <clears throat> and where that object lives in that, in that object tree. <clears throat> when you map your views in Pyramid onto your either uh, URL dispatch or your Python code, they can be any kind of a callable. So a view can be anything as simple as a just a function uh, declaration, or it could be a, a class or even an instance. <clears throat> as long as it's callable, uh, it can be used as a view inside the pyramid system. Renderer-based views, which are ones that uh, specify, in the, in the case of like the Chameleon templating engine, they can specify a, a renderer, which would be a page template, a ZPT file that would actually uh, handle the, the rendering of that uh, that function or that class uh, can actually return just simple dictionaries instead of having to return a, a web like response or some kind of a custom object that would be consumed by the framework to build uh, that view up. So it makes it very easy. It just uses this, the built-in dictionary you know, Python data type, which is very simple to work with. He can actually support multiple views per route. So depending on various conditions, a single route can be uh, can display different views based on maybe even HTTP headers or whether it's a get or a post or a put. So supporting things like JSON views and things like that can be done uh, right from the, the built-in view system. And then you can build response adapters. So if you actually wanted to just return a plain Python string or if you wanted to return a tuple as part of your view, you can actually configure via the, the configuration mechanisms what type of view adapter or how that uh, gets turned into a, a response and sent back to the page or to the, the web browser. So those response adapters, I don't, I have not seen them used in practice much, but if you did have a simple use case where you needed to basically have a function that returned a string and needed to know how to render that into the page, you can use those response adapters to do that. Pyramid was designed with extensibility in mind. Uh, they have uh, the first point here it's kind of hard to wrap your head around unless you're actually doing this, but the flexibility for deployments into multiple environments. Uh, there's no uh, global, uh, you'd have to read up on this one in the documentation, but basically this concept of no singletons makes it easy to do that multi-tenant uh, web applications inside of Pyramid itself. In addition, Pyramid has been designed to allow you to compose multiple Python packages into one uh, Pyramid app and have them all look uh, the same the, you may see the word tweens mentioned in the documentation. And basically that's just like what WSGI middleware was, but instead of running inside of the, the WSGI server itself as like a pipeline that you'd send requests down through, the WSGI middleware actually runs in the context of that pyramid application itself. So it has access to 
the uh, existing configuration and data that's inside that pyramid app versus having to pass it around uh, in the request and the response objects as part of the WSGI. So I know there's a lot of talking there and, and a bunch of text to get started, but as a quick start, I wanted to just show you guys what is pretty much the world's smallest pyramid app. You know, 14 lines, and then actually we have a running Hello World uh, pyramid app, single file web application. So if I go over to our uh, terminal here, I have that, uh, that app basically loaded up here, ready to roll, so we can try it out. And if we just run Python hello, you won't see much happening there, but if we go over to here and go to localhost 8080 slash hello sixies, it basically returns uh, hello sixies. So in the case of this code here, uh, this has this is using the URL dispatch method for mapping uh, view to some function. So in this case, our view function is this hello hello world function right here. It returns the response object hello and then whatever is matched from the the route. So you can see down here we added a route. I'll show you some more uh, route matching techniques uh, in a couple slides here, but basically. It does a match on slash hello. If I did something other than slash hello, we'd get a 404. So if I just did like slash 60s, we just get a 404 because there's nothing configured to handle that route being passed in the URL. And this can be pretty flexible when you need to basically expose various parts of your application. Uh, you've got some interesting things you can do there by basically capturing portions of the URL and passing it as a dictionary in the request back to your, your view functions. So that's pretty much the basics of a, the whole world for Pyramid. And so that's just the beginning. There's lots and lots of things you can do. That's kind of the more micro framework view of Pyramid. But if we look at uh, ways we can actually build more robust applications, there are uh, ways you can actually generate your own applications. Out of the box, Pyramid comes with what are called scaffolds. And these are the three that come out of the box, which is the starter, the alchemy scaffold, which is based on a SQL alchemy persistence layer, and the ZODB scaffold, which is using the ZODB as its persistence layer. Then we at Six Feet Up have built our own, uh, thanks to some of the work of Nolan and Clayton, uh, put it into 60 scale. We can actually have some more options for using build out and actually providing uh, various instances for uh, all the various environments, you know, development environments, production environments, staging environments, and your local environments. So there's there's many different options there if you actually download and use the 60 scale way of generating a, a, per, a real pyramid project. The scaffolds will generate a single egg that's ready to run, you know, with a kind of a command line you know, simpleness, but the 60 scale builds, build outs are going to give you a full build out with your applications egg in the source directory and all the standard stuff we're kind of used to from the build out world. So again, Pyramid doesn't make any uh, choices for you when it comes to templating. Out of the box, it comes with two templating engines ready for you to use. The Chameleon, which is more the default one I think most people are going to use with Pyramid, which is based on Zope page templates. And then the Mako templates, which were uh, what were originally in pylons and are still usable in the default uh, pyramid application. So it's just showing a, a couple examples of how you configure a view for ZPTs versus how you attach a view or a template to your uh, view for Mako. The view config up here, you'll see it's using a, a, a relative path definition to the view temp the page template itself. So that'll be in uh, it'll be relative to where this module itself lives. So sample view lives inside of a, a Python file and that same directory will be a templates directory with a foo.pt inside of it and this just handles hooking that up as the renderer of this dictionary of information. So this dictionary would be passed in the view to the foo page template there. Mako is a little bit different. It doesn't support the same uh, relative um, association like the chameleon templates do. You actually have to specify in the, in the initial configuration where your Mako templates live. And then from there you can use, you can basically just put in the file name of the Mako template you want. But you have to do some initial configuration of where your Mako templates live before you can actually use them inside of uh, Pyramid. There's a support for Jinja 2 uh, through the Pyramid under Jinja 2 uh, package. 
again, you'd have to configure where its templates live like you do with the Maka ones. Only the Chameleon templates give you that a little more automatic uh, discovery or automatic referencing of your, your page template files themselves. <clears throat> so in the application URLs, you can use traversal or, or routes, which is the URL dispatch. Traversal is something we're very familiar with here, again, because of using Zope and Plone. When you want to set up using traversal inside your application, you basically, when making the configuration, need to specify this root factory, which will be the root object inside the ZODB, for example, of your application. And then from there, URLs get mapped onto various paths and, and, uh, and views get passed on, sort of like we do with Z, uh, ZCML, so you can actually specify that for these interfaces, these, these views apply. And then you can generate URLs in your application for those traversal objects by basically using the, the built-in of the request. Uh, looking for a resource URL, it'll pass back to you the, the URL based on your virtual hosting environment or what, whatever environment you're in so that you can avoid breaking, you know, having hard-coded links inside your application. Uh, I have an, an example of showing setting up application URLs in traversal. So I've got two applications here. Uh, one of these is the uh, quick mobile app backend we did for HCMS. In this one, you can see here we've got a root factory that does a connection to our uh, ZODB backend. And then down inside of the, um, the configuration here, we'll specify that as, where's it at? Here it is. We specify the root factory, passing in that function. And from there, it now knows how to do traversal across those objects that are inside the ZODB. It is actually possible to combine the two uh, techniques together. You can do route-based matching and traversal-based matching. Uh, there's a page on it in the documentation that's very specific about it. The route-based matching, which is a little more familiar to people who have come from a, the Django world or from the, using pylons, the prede you know, predecessor to Pyramid, routes allow you to configure uh, URL matches and have those get automatically routed to a specific uh, piece of view code. So you can see down here we've got um, a route being added from my route with a slash prefix and then it captures the next two path elements, sticks them into a dictionary with the key being one and the, uh, the next key being two and then the values being whatever was put into the URL bar. So those get passed back into your uh, view as part of the requests that you can then use inside your view code to make decisions or to do configuration or whatever you need to use it for. The second example down here uh, is using a, it's doing a capture, or like a remainder capture at the end. So anything after ABC in the URL <clears throat> is going to get it put into a key called foo with a tuple for each item that's after ABC. So if it was ABC, D, E, F, there would be a key called foo with a tuple for D, E, and F uh, in it. So you can actually capture then arbitrary uh, URLs. Um, remainders that are stuck on the end of the URL. So if your application is doing some kind of you know crazy data passing in the URL, you could actually capture those very easily. And you can see here and here we've got the uh, the views have been imported and then they're configured and then linked up to the configuration. So this is more the imperative style of configuration. This add view could be removed and actually be done with a decorator inside the view code itself. So you could actually do it right in the same spot as where you're actually writing your view code by defining the view there and then you add the routes still like this in the imperative way. Uh, then generating URLs for these uh, routes or URL dispatched based URLs is basically similar to what we did with the um, traversal one. There's a, a built-in method for route URLs, passing it in <clears throat> the uh, view name, and then the various uh, paths that would be passed in as part of the keys. You can pass those in as well as, as arguments, and then it'll give you back the correctly rendered URL for whatever environment you're in. Now, as far as persistence goes, uh, we can use ZODB, like I'd shown in that first example, or we can use SQL Alchemy. I was going to show a couple of those examples here. So in this first one I had already mentioned, we were using ZODB as the backend data store for this application itself. So all we had to do was configure a root factory, and then from there, inside of our views, uh, we'll do uh, our storage of our data inside of here. So if I look at like a, an edit view, for example, you'll see we can actually create a new speaker. And then inside the speaker or that context, we actually just save those objects inside the ZODB like 
if you were doing a more manual ZODB application, not necessarily a Plone app, but if you're doing a Zope app, this would be very familiar to people who are more familiar with using the, the Zope way of storing uh, objects inside of the other objects inside the ZODB. The other way is the SQL Alchemy apps. So here's a quick little SQL Alchemy app. Basically inside the configuration, I set up a, uh, a database connection string, and then I've configured routes uh, for my various parts of the application. And then inside of my code, I use SQL Alchemy to, to store and, and retrieve data as I normally would. And you could you have options of doing whatever you like here. I mean, the pyramid doesn't make any kind of assumptions about specific types of persistence being available. So you could use MongoDB or any other you know, type of way that you like to safely store your data. Uh, just some documentation here. I, this is all based off the Pyramid 1.4 docs, and then I also get a nice little link to, there to the Pyramid Denials, which specifically states that Pyramid was not written by aliens. So I don't know, any questions?